Hey there, I'm Joey from EDHREC, and I wanted to share an interesting story with you. This is the story of why I took apart my favorite commander deck, Marin of Clan Altoth, and decided to turn it into something completely different, and why that might be the best Magic the Gathering decision I ever made. So, Marin. We all know Marin, we all love Marin, or more likely, hate Marin. She remains one of the most popular legends in the entire format, among the top echelon of Golgari commanders. We're all pretty familiar with her by now. Sacrifice your own creatures to get experience counters, and use those experience counters to resurrect awesome creatures. I had this Marin deck for years, literally like seven years. I'm a graveyard guy. I absolutely love to reanimate creatures, especially when I can do it en masse, and I particularly love sacrificing my own stuff for additional value. I enjoy a use all parts of the buffalo approach to playing magic, but I especially like the resiliency that a graveyard based deck represents. Whenever your opponents take down your stuff, you can just resurrect it back, back, back again. Reviving from the graveyard doesn't just cheat around huge mana costs, although that is definitely a huge bonus, but it also represents to your opposition that you are scrappy, adaptive, and that you can take the heat and still remain standing. I don't know, maybe I'm being too corny right off the bat, but I think that those are really good qualities for a game to teach. This deck went through many iterations, and it's where I put a lot of my juiciest favorite cards or treasured possessions that I was lucky enough to trade for so many years ago. My favorite, and some might even argue signature card, is Living Death. I currently play this in, no joke, like four of my EDH decks. It is such a massive swing. Load the graveyard with mill and tutor effects, sacrifice all my own creatures in play, and then cast this to revive a bazillion creatures while setting my enemies back by miles. Dozens have entered the battlefield and death triggers lay at my feet to bury my opponents in life drain and aristocracy goodness. And if my opponents happen to survive it all after the dust settles, an eternal witness and a sacrifice outlet will usually let me do it all over again. So everything I just described right there, that's all my favorite stuff to do in Magic. That's why I don't just have one graveyard deck, I have lots of them. Conrad, Mimeoplasm, Wilhelt, I adore reanimation, I adore sacrifice, and I just love when a bunch of stuff comes out of the graveyards to bury my opponents instead. So why then did I take this Marin deck apart? As the commander format has surged in popularity, I have definitely noticed an interesting shift both within the community and within myself in terms of how we approach the ideas of commander deck longevity and our willingness to take apart a deck. And <laughs> all I can say is that time was, I genuinely thought I would never get rid of a single one of my commander decks. I would never dismantle them, never change them, never take them apart ever. This was back in 2011, 2013, that's about how long ago it was. And yeah, you just would not have been able to convince me that I ever would take apart any of those decks because of how much heart and soul and work and creative expression I'd put into them and how sentimentally attached to them I feel. And I still feel that way towards some of my decks for sure, but my emotion overall has definitely changed over the years, and that's an interesting phenomenon to observe. And I'm not kidding when I say sentimental attachment either. Like my first deck is the Mimeoplasm, and that's my T-Rex boy, that's my baby. Or my second ever deck I built because my husband bought me a random Theros pack and I happened to open a Krufix God of Horizons. And I played that deck for years. But here's the thing, that turned out to be a very controlling type of deck. And what I realized over time was that it wasn't bringing as much joy to the table for everyone else, just me. And that's why I eventually took it apart. And that's kind of what happened with Marin too. Like no one ever gave me a hard time about it or anything, but man, Marin's kind of a lot. Like she folds to graveyard exile effects in a heartbeat, but when she's allowed to do her thing, it's pretty bonkers. And I don't just mean her win conditions being bonkers, I actually mainly mean her methods of removal. I sure had a lot of big sacrifice effects in that deck that would keep any Voltron player from being able to do kind of anything. Recurring Spore Frog over and over meant that I was nearly impossible to kill at all, which extinguished all hope for my opponents who were playing big stompy decks. And to be clear, these are badass synergies. Tons of commanders out there have awesome capabilities like this. Like we've probably all seen a Muldrotha or a Landfall deck consistently reset a Glacial Chasm, for instance. 
Honestly, I find myself in a pretty tricky spot here trying to illustrate this point. Like, on the one hand, sure, Marin might be bonkers, but so is Edgar, so is Muldrotha, so is Eureka. The commander format is full to the brim with powerful commanders, so why would I undercut my own chances at success against commanders like those? The reason we play commander is to unlock cool and powerful synergies and share that cool experience with other people. And the very last thing that I want to do is make any content that implies that people, quote, ought to feel guilty or anything about the deck choices that they make or anything like that. Plus, this is a multiplayer game. Interaction is expected. Our opponents ought to be bringing some type of removal with them to deal with any of their deck's weaknesses. So that does make me feel a little bit weird about fixating on effects like Spore Frog or constant sacrifice removal that might keep any opponents off of their game. But on the other hand, I have a lot of lived experience playing this deck against other people, including members of my family, whom I love and care about deeply. And that has definitely shown me that sometimes a deck like this can be a lot more draining to deal with. And frankly, this is also all clarity that I only have with the benefit of hindsight. Like, I think there was actually a mental trick that I might have pulled on myself to help justify my use of all of those things, like repeating sacrifice effects over and over to keep enemy boards completely clear. And that mental trick is because of certain cards like Mind Slicer. This is obviously a good card in a Marin deck. It's able to repeatedly keep enemy hands completely empty while Marin herself can dig through her graveyard. I never ran this card. It just didn't produce the types of games that I like. I wanted my opponents to still be able to do the thing, but I wanted to best them even when they got to do the thing. And I think that since I didn't play overt cards like Mind Slicer, I could kind of justify playing a whole bunch of other stuff because they didn't stick out as egregious. And it's true, they're not egregious. Dictate of Erebos is not an egregious card by really any means. But since it didn't stick out as brightly as Mind Slicer, I blinded myself to the ways that cards like this did not produce the gameplay patterns I actually wanted. Those types of effects did shut off the gameplay experience I actively said I wanted to have. But since it didn't look as bad as Mind Slicer, I grew myopic about the fact that my deck was punching above its weight class, and I failed to see its actual impact on my, and especially on my opponent's, game experiences. And of course, let's make sure we crack open some nuance here. I mentioned Glacial Chasm and Constant Mists earlier, both of which I currently have in my Titania deck. I play lots of sacrifice effects in my Sir Conrad deck. Also, I have a Sir Conrad deck. Like, that's also, he's pretty nutty. He's bonkers. Have you seen him go off with a mind crank? It's disgusting. And the distinction there is that Conrad and Titania are decks that I have intentionally built to be pretty devastating. I don't reach for those decks unless the table says, yes, we don't want a silly game. We want a sweaty game. They're not lean back and enjoy the ride type of decks. They are big challengers. And somewhere subconsciously, that's not what I wanted my Marin deck to be but I discovered over time that I actually shouldn't be pulling this deck out unless the whole table is in the mood for a very punchy game. And when the table was in the mood for that type of experience, well, that's what Conrad and Titania were for. So over time, I just noticed that I didn't reach for my Marin deck hardly at all, because I wanted her to exist at a more social level, but the way I had built her wasn't suitable for that experience. So I had a choice to make, either commit to it and juice that deck up so that it would operate at that level, or scale things back and create a sillier social deck, even though it wouldn't have a lot of the stuff in it that made me fall in love with the Marin deck in the first place. And you know what? This is a choice I've made before. My Mimeoplasm deck used to be my bonkers powerful deck, swimming with mana crypts and survival of the fittest and infect targets, but it meant that I reserved that deck only for hardcore challenging games, so I played it way less often. And I missed playing that deck casually, so I overhauled it. I decided to instead seek out goofier Mimeoplasm combinations that were still powerful, but also a little bit funky. So making a deck more social is definitely a thing I've done before, but doing that with Mimeo felt so much easier than trying to do it with Marin. Perhaps the ooze with the T-Rex arm just lends itself more to a silly experience, or perhaps Marin's reputation precedes her no matter where you go. But either way, I didn't feel like I would get what I wanted if I made her stronger or if I scaled her back. All I knew was that when game day came around, I was reaching for her less and less. And dang it, I wanted a deck where I could do all of my sacrifice and reanimate shenanigans and still have a great time no matter who I was playing against, whether it was against strangers, friends, or even my family. So when a little card called Baba La Saga came out, y'all, I was a goner. Three mana, three, three. 
tap, sack up to three permanents, and if you hit at least three card types among them, you gain three, they lose three, and you draw three. Babala Saga is the best deck I've ever played, just flat out. In fact, I don't even refer to her as Babala Saga anymore. I call her my baby lasagna, because yes, I am in fact 12. And you know, anytime that I build a new deck, I always get that new fun energy where I just can't stop playing it. It feels like the best thing ever. But over time, that new energy and overwhelming excitement usually eventually burns out and the deck feels a lot more normal and less novel. But I have been playing Baby Baba for months, and so far she has massively resisted that burnout. I only fall more and more madly in love with this stinking deck. It is just all of my favorite things at once. I can't even say I've optimized this deck to a T or anything. I just threw in all the cards that I like that finally have a reason to all live under the same roof. I get to use all of my most loved legends, some of my most treasured enchantments and artifacts, and win conditions that I could never pull off in other places. This deck even gets to include a bunch of cards that were only ever in my maybe boards for my other graveyardy decks. And I gotta say, so many people misread this commander. It doesn't say sacrifice three permanents. It says sacrifice up to three permanents. You can sacrifice an enchantment, an artifact, and a creature, or an enchantment and an artifact creature, or vice versa. Or my personal favorite, animate a Mishra's Factory or a Blink Moth Nexus and sacrifice just that one permanent because it's an artifact, creature, and a land. One permanent to draw three cards and drain three life that is utter perfection. I've gotten so many messages from people and so many reactions from other players where they were like, wait a second, hold on, what does that card do again? In fact, when I very first built this deck, I even got to bamboozle now rules committee member Jim Lepage on a charity stream run by Tomer from MTG Goldfish. And to sum up, yeah, Jim is right. Don't sleep on this commander. She's so dang good. And to be completely honest, the rest of this video is just going to devolve into me gushing about my favorite stuff in this deck. Like, hell yeah, I loved Viridian Emissary and Primal Druid in my Marin deck. And they're even better here, because my commander is also a sacrifice outlet. Notice how Ordeal of Nylia doesn't care how it gets sacrificed, it just grabs lands when it gets sacrificed. I get to play lands that have multiple card types so that I can find more ingredients for Baby Lasagna's deadly potions. The Saga even makes artifact creature tokens, if we ever need them. I get to play enchantments that return themselves to hand after they get eaten, so they can be perpetually reused. Or enchantments that return this sacrificed creature back to play so that they can be eaten all over again. We can use creatures of multiple card types like Dryad of the Elysian Grove and Sanctum Weaver to get tons of awesome benefits and then pitch them when they've run their course. Or use cards like Ashaya that also turn all of the creatures into lands. Plus, we can turn them into artifacts at the same time because of those liquid metal darlings helping adjust all of those card types. And these are also super good if we ever need to turn any enemy card into an artifact so that a Rex Age and other artifact removal can demolish anything that gets metallicized. There are tons upon tons upon tons of amazing artifacts to play that give extra benefits when they enter or when they die, including Ugin's Nexus, which can draw cards, gain life, and get an extra turn. And you can use Patriar Seal and Instill Energy and Thousand Year Elixir to activate Baby Lasagna multiple times a turn. Are you kidding me? It's so beautiful. <laughs> Y'all, this video was so hard to write because I just kept on bursting into giggle fits every time I tried writing about how cool these things are. Like, this deck is so much fun, you guys. I cannot deal with it. All right. Whew, serious face. Let's keep going. And then, of course, there are the payoffs. Classic aristocrats goodness. Baba eats tons of creatures and artifacts, and these cards all help turn that snacking into lethal damage over the course of the game. And sometimes they're also just dang good sacrifice fodder all on their own. And since we're eating so many lands, I love to play my Bay Titania in here too, as well as the Gitrog monster to get even more benefits from eating up that mana base. Heck, sometimes I will just eat lands even if I won't get Baba's full ability, just to make elementals with Titania. And if my boy Mazarek is in play, he'll make the whole team huge. And you know what else gets really bonkers? Blossoming Bog Beast is a house. Gain three life with Baba and then attack with this and a couple one ones, then gain two more life from the Bog Beast itself, and now everything is hitting for plus five with Trample? Even more if we happen to activate the lasagna multiple times a turn, or if we've gained life from, say, Coca Show? And there's still a ton of classic recursion and reanimation too. Not just my number one favorite card, Living Death, but the reanimation enchantments like Animate Dead and Necromancy are just 
fire here because Baba can eat those creatures and the enchantments to draw even more cards. Oh, my Lanta, I need to cool down. Like, this is why this deck is my dream. It gets even more value out of the best reanimation spells that I already love. And speaking of recursion, bringing back lands is hugely important because baby lasagna will often default to eating her own lands and we definitely need to mitigate the loss of mana resources. Her effect's super powerful, but we don't want to end up on turn seven with only three lands in play. So Splendid Reclamation, ah, this is like my number two favorite card ever. And there are tons of other cards that perform a similar role in this deck. We can even trigger World Shaper at will by sacrificing it with the commander. And with stuff like Crucible, Ramanop, Aranus, or restore, we can repeatedly bring back one of our powerhouse lands like Mishra's Factory to chomp on it over and over and over and over again. Every single piece of this deck interacts with like nine other pieces of this deck. It is a smorgasbord of just all my favorite cards finally working together in one place. I get to mix my favorite parts of Marin with my favorite parts of Conrad, with my favorite parts of Titania, and like all of my other favorite graveyard decks, without treading too directly into those commanders' territory or overshadowing the strategies of my other favorite decks. And best of all, it gets to do so at a power level not only that I enjoy, but that my opponents enjoy even when we're playing a more casual or social game. Baby Lasagna has produced more moments of my opponent saying, oh, that's cool, than any other deck I've ever built. Well, okay, aside from maybe my Commander Commander deck, that one is also definitely a fan favorite. But regardless, that reaction from other people is one of the best experiences that I ever could ask for in this game. As a necromancer through and through, I didn't want to only have graveyard decks that I only play when the table is going pedal to the metal. I needed a signature graveyard deck that I would feel excited and happy to play in any social environment, whether it was against my friends, my family, or complete strangers. And I've been able to scale some other graveyardy decks down to this level too. Mimeo has turned a little goofier in his tenure, and I built my zombie deck to be played like I'm a zombie, because it's just silly fun that way. But now I've got Babala Saga fitting in here too, exactly where I wanted that Marin deck to be. She's social, fun, interactive, very powerful, but very stoppable. And even when I'm doing my absolutely gross graveyard shenanigans, it fills my opponents with awe and joy rather than, you know, dread. That right there is the thing I'm always after. A deck that can thrill you even as it beats you. As my podcast co-hosts once said, build decks you would enjoy losing to. It's not just about whether I've fallen in love with the deck, it's about whether my opponents love it too. And who knows, as I keep experimenting with this deck more and more, I feel that Marin herself might even come to feature in the 99. After all, Baba always wants more guests for dinner. So now I want to hear from you. What decks have you taken apart and what, if anything, did they transform into? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, remember, EDH wreck your deck before you wreck your deck. Wreck your deck.